Winter is slowly starting to come to an end. Spring is peeking its head around the corner, and that can only mean one thing. Daily coverage of the Iditarod is back, and if you need help breaking down all things in the world of the Iditarod, do I have a show for you. It's the daily coverage of the Iditarod on Mushing Radio, presented by Dogworks Radio. Join hosts Robert Forto and Alex Stein as they offer insight, analysis, and plenty of commentary throughout the race and beyond. If you are a fan of all the action and excitement that the Iditarod brings, the daily coverage of the race is the podcast for you. Robert and Alex will give you everything you need to get ready for the race. In just a moment, you will get to hear a preview of their Iditarod coverage. And while you are listening, subscribe to DogWorks Radio on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you are listening right now. There is also a link in the episode notes. Welcome to the daily coverage of the Iditarod, friends and fans. My name is Robert Forto, and I'm joined by my good friend Alex Stein, and we host a podcast about the Iditarod. So, Alex, here's what I'm thinking. Instead of telling people about the show and what we do, how about we preview the race and recap the day's news and really dive deep? Why don't we just tell the people very specific things we like about the Iditarod and how our show will bring a smile to our friends' faces? I love it. I'll go first. And I say this every year, but I think the Iditarod is really three or four different races that go on simultaneously. There's the race to win, which is very exciting and gets the bulk of the attention. In most years, there are maybe a dozen teams that might conceivably win the race, given the right combination of dog performance, luck, weather, trail conditions, and more luck. And then there's the middle of the pack mushers, journeymen and journey women teams who know that they're not going to win, but they still compete because they love the lifestyle. And while sometimes over a period of years, teams will move up from the middle of the pack to the front, and sometimes even those teams might eventually win, their focus isn't on competing with others and trying to get to Nome first. And then there's my favorite race, the back of the packers. These are often rookies or people who are running the race for particular reasons, like to promote a cause or to honor someone who has died, etc. And there are great stories in all parts of the race, but my heart is always with the mushers at the back of the pack, especially those relatively new to the race or those who are running as a once or sometimes twice in a lifetime experience. Do you have a personal favorite musher? I don't. When pressed... I will usually name a female musher and predict that she'll win, often Ali Zirkel, because I love that sled dog racing is one of the few sports where men and women compete on an equal footing. But the other thing I've realized about sled dog racing is that, unlike most other sports, fans don't root against teams. In football, there's always fans who passionately hate the Patriots, for example, and in baseball, there are always fans who can't stand the Yankees or the Red Sox. But in sled dog racing, I don't see that. Sure, fans will have their favorites, but I've never seen anyone actively hoping that a musher or his or her team will fail. Maybe it's because long distance mushing is inherently dangerous and we recognize the achievement of anyone who can train and qualify and complete a race, or even the achievement of someone who recognizes that a race isn't fun for the dogs anymore and scratches. So someone might want Mitch Seavey to win and someone else might be pulling for Nick Pettit. But generally, I hear fans say that they want every team to finish and have all dogs and all humans be healthy and happy. But they also want their favorite team to do all of that a little bit faster than the other teams. Robert, how about you? I don't have a favorite that I root for every year, but I sure do like the stories about the rookies and their chances in the race. There is something special about the Iditarod. Not only is it full of history and the longest sporting event in North America, but there are just so many stories. So many media outlets just concentrate on the top contenders, and our show, we dive deep each night and profile a musher each night and tell our listeners a little bit of known facts about them and their dogs. As a dog musher for more than 30 years, I can't get enough. I love to share my insights to the sport and how some decisions are made on the trail. Alex, how about those stories at the checkpoints? Those are always interesting. 
Right. Every year we hear stories from checkpoints that range from dogs who run off and run hundreds of miles back to their home kennels to mushers performing MacGyver-like repairs on their sleds out on the trail to mushers being surprised by relatives who fly into remote checkpoints to cheer them up. And that's not even counting the stories of village hospitality and the traditions that have sprung up over the years at certain checkpoints. Even though the Iditarod takes more than a week, as the mushers and their dog teams travel almost a thousand miles in some of the most in- inhospitable conditions in the country, it is the stories of chasing dreams and the trials and tribulations on the trail that make this sport so interesting. By any rational way of looking at it, going a thousand miles with 14 dogs through some of the most remote and beautiful parts of the world in extreme temperatures is practically impossible. But at this point, Iditarod has a history stretching back now almost 50 years of people who see something that seems impossible and figuring out how to accomplish it. Long distance mushing truly is a sport for people who, in the words of Colonel Norman Vaughn, dream big and dare to fail. Alex, I love when there is a change in strategy in the middle of the race. Do you remember that time when Lance Mackey snuck out of the checkpoint and left Jeff King sleeping? Suddenly we had an entirely different race. Right, and weather can turn the race upside down as well. Remember a few years back when Jeff King had a solid lead approaching safety and suddenly the tracker showed his team stop just a few miles from the checkpoint? I loved the feeling of watching the tracker in the middle of the night with fans from all over the world and wondering what had happened as first Allie and then Dallas Seavey passed Jeff. And as we'd find out later, it was an enormous windstorm that blew in and let Dallas come from behind, costing Jeff King his fifth win and eventually costing Allie her first. I love how passionate the fans have become following the Iditarod on social media, especially Twitter. It amazes me that some people, including you, Alex, are up all hours of the night tweeting and talking about the race. I'm guilty as charged with that. And one of the things I realize every year is just how big Iditarod is. It's so big that it's almost a miracle the race can even happen year after year. Especially when you think of how long the trail is and how most of the time mushers are out there alone with their dogs and maybe with a couple of other teams traveling nearby. The first year that I came up to watch the start of Iditarod, I was talking to a back-of-the-pack musher, and he said he wished the press and the public and the fans would remember that there's a lot more to the race than the top 10 finishers. And that's something that stuck with me and something I think about every year. So, Robert, what's the deal with our Iditarod podcast? So it seems like a fair question. Here's what we do. We podcast year-round talking about all things mushing here on DogWorks Radio. But for two weeks in March, we concentrate solely on the Iditarod. During those weeks in March, we not only preview the race and recap each night, but we also try to make our fans as much as part of the show as we can. And this year, we're doing some things that are a little bit different. We're opening up a voicemail line where fans can leave messages and ask us questions. So every day, we'll respond to your questions, cover breaking news of the day, do a musher profile, and compress all of that into a tidy package that you can get right here on the DogWorks radio feed. Not only will you learn about the race, but also how fans are responding to it over the course of those two weeks. We have been doing this show for almost eight years, and I can't even believe that. What all has happened in that span of time? We've seen a lot of rule changes, equipment changes, a doping scandal, the start moving to Fairbanks not once but twice, a drunk individual attacking two of the leading mushers, disqualifications, veteran mushers being rejected from the race, speed records falling, and the crowning of both the youngest ever and the oldest ever Iditarod champion. We have seen the dynasties of the CVs. We have seen a changing of the guard and Iditarod. We have seen the Iditarod develop in a major way on social media. We've done live shows. We've done shows from the trail and at the restart. We've even traveled to some of the checkpoints, including Nome. What we are trying to say is, if you're an Iditarod fan, you should check out our daily coverage of the race right here on DogWorks Radio. Subscribe now and become part of the weird Iditarod universe. Once again, we are on DogWorks Radio, available everywhere, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, DogWorksRadio.com, or wherever you're listening to this show right now.